Welcome, Meredith, to Wellness Spring. It's such an honor to have you on the show today. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And it is such a treat to be here with you, Beverly. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Dear listeners, my guest today is Meredith Gaston, who is an amazing creative goddess. I'm in awe of her wonderful, wonderful gifts and her, just her amazing energy. She is a best-selling author, world-renowned artist, international wellness coach and speaker, and that's only the icing on top of the cake. And just for a bit of background, I was blessed to meet um, Meredith through a communal friend, Deidre Kelly, who at that time was an amazing um, numerologist, and she's gone on to do some coaching work now. And Deidre's sister, Roisin, was one of my uh, Reiki students, and she gifted me one of your books, um, The Art of Wellbeing, which I instantly fell in love with. I was holding the book and just absolutely loving it and feeling the energy and got all my students to do the same. And it became like a Bible in my healing room so people could flick through the pages and see what they were drawn to. And because when we, when I'm teaching Reiki, we do a lot of mindful eating. So we don't speak when we have our communal lunch and we all bring different things together. And I, and of course it's plant based. So I know we have lots of things in common being vegan and, um, on our wellness journey and global travelers. And, um, so yeah, they, we tried many of the recipes and today I would like to talk about your latest book, which thank you again for gifting it to me, Choosing Love. And as soon as I opened, well, as soon as the package arrived, because my elderly friend rang me and said, you've got a package here, Bev, and he's so in the now. And he's like, look, something special. And then when I opened it out and the beautiful packaging with the beautiful pink bows and just the whole unfolding of it, I actually took a photograph of it all and a little video, which I'll share with the written notes for this. Yeah, I absolutely loved it. And now this is by my bedside because as a self-love coach, you know, it just wore my heart, choosing love. And then just this line, living our lives to nourish our hearts and a beautiful heart. And because whenever I do a post on Instagram or anywhere, I write dear friends. And over the years, I've written dear hearts. And when uh -huh. I saw your letters, but these are like dear hearts, such meaningful Oh my goodness, those letters. So without further ado, could you tell everyone, the listeners, what inspired you or who inspired you or how did this book come about? Because having chatted with you before, I remember you saying that the publishers weren't too keen on the topic, but thankfully you insisted and I know it's going to touch millions of souls. So thank you. Mm, well, thank you. So much, Beverly. So with, with the book on love, the first time I mentioned this book was in a meeting with my publishers and there were quite a few people in the room. And when I said I would like to do a book on love, they said, oh, on, on, on romance? And I said, no, on love, <laughs> on big love, <laughs> the bigger picture of love. And they said, so, so relationships? And I said, well, yes, but starting with the self, and then relationships with it, our relationships with each other and our relationship with life itself, our relationship with the spirit of life, with the earth, with being alive, with our own aliveness. And, um, and I think that the publisher said to me, oh, thank you, the publisher said to me, look, that's very ambitious, Meredith, but if you'd like to do it, then you should go ahead and do it. <laughs> said, I'd love to do it. I'd to go ahead and do it. And I remember thinking... It didn't seem ambitious to me. It just felt very natural. I didn't see the topic as daunting. I felt that, that the topic was embracing me and that I would embrace the topic and that it would be this synergistic flowing, which it was, flowing yeah. experience of, of learning and communicating and 
representing um, what I felt to be, um, or honouring what I felt to be our collective human need for love, for love right now, not, not in any other time or place, but right here and now, because we need it more than ever. We know that, we feel it. We intuitively feel that we are at a point in time where love is the tonic, love is the healer, love is the way. And I wanted to share love as a way of life, not, not a feeling. Not a, People say, oh, love is, it might be a feeling or it's an emotion or, yes, it's an experience. It's a way of life. And that is how I came to the title, choosing love. Because for me, love is a choice in every moment. In every moment, we have a, a choice. And we're so creative by virtue of being thinkers. We're thinkers and we create with our thoughts. We create our reality with the thoughts that we choose to think. And if we are anchored into loving thoughts, we are committed to loving thoughts. We are created and creating from loving thoughts. Then we are going to be living magical lives that nourish our hearts and that are in loving service of, of others and, and the earth and our collective well-being, our collective health and happiness. It's not just about us, but it begins with us. It begins with us. And that's what I wanted to share with people because I'm a very gentle, I'm a gentle person, but I'm a passionate person. And I'm all about empowering both my, myself and all those with whom I share life and hopefully all my readers to see that we all have what it takes. We're not missing anything. We're living in a world that keeps telling us we're missing something or needing something. It's the foundation of advertising and consumerism. And, and yet we actually have all that we need within to create loving, passionate, attuned, conscious, creative lives of meaning and purpose. We're not lacking anything. We're not missing anything. And that's why years ago I wrote a book about gratitude, The Art of Gratitude. And this book was, was, uh, was so important for me to write at that point in time. And I live, I live gratefully. I live in such a spirit of gratitude that nothing slips my appreciation from a cloud to you know, at least if I'm present, that is, and I endeavour to be present. I, I, my, my greatest wish is to be completely present and to be attentive to life and to myself and to those, you know, those I love and my pets and my gut, you know, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, but yeah. to be present and to be attentive. And, and that is my aim. And, and so, you know, with that, I, I figure that if I, in a spirit of gratitude, we are in a state of, um, of receivership, constant receivership, and we focus on that which we have rather than that which we feel that we're lacking on some level. And similarly, uh, gratitude and love, they vibrate very, very high, you know, in the, in the energetic atmosphere. We have these other lower emotions like, you know, we've got fear and, 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 and greed and, and resentment and um guilt and uh these feelings that are really low vib vibrational feelings and then up here we have we have gratitude we have love we have joy and we feel you you know as a reiki master and you work with energy constantly you feel vibrationally within your body the shift from a momentary in intercept of a thought that is low vibrational and shifting that to a thought that is high vibrational, that is founded in love, essentially. I find love like the mother energy, all the yeah. other energies of gratitude and, and hope, and and that they they are they within the, the they're within the heart of love to, to me. They they dwell within the greater heart of, of love, and love is the greatest, highest energy, in my opinion. And to me yeah. as a human being, that feel love to feel and that's why we need to go straight to the top now because we're living in an uncertain confused stressed strained world we've spoken to one another about the violence about the unrest about the anxiety and what is an antidote we're looking at love we've got to, we've got to go straight we've got to, to straight to the top yeah and we and dwell not 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 just <laughs> not just flirt with it but actually choose it and dwell in it and share it and be it because like any practice over the years and I've, I've written about kindness and about gratitude the more we practice it it becomes effortless and natural we become it we're no longer necessarily even though we have to refresh our commitment by virtual ch choice we become it and then we 
move through life, we journey through life, sharing it by our presence alone. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And you covered so much then, like from saying about how you lead through your gentleness because a lot of people think you know that you have to be strong and boisterous and out there but you know just you can be strong and powerful but be sweet and gentle at the same time and make an impact and love as you said is the remedy love is the action and now is the time for us to embody it and remember our true nature and purpose you know the very mm. core our innate beings are divine love. You know, we're just here on a temporary journey in these um, physical bodies. And when we take our first okay. breath, we, we embody this. And when we take our last breath, it's like, who are we really? It's only, I like to say to my Reiki students, I believe, you know, when we die, it's only our physical body and our soul mm. or spirit or life force energy continues, you know, absolutely. so. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And I had a conversation about this over the dinner table last night with my husband and we were talking about meditation and he said to me, he told me a wonderful story about a meditation he had when he was 20 and or thereabouts and he went back to that time and described the experience and he said it was wonderful to be meditating so frequently at that point that he said for the most part I just felt like um he said I was so aware of being this expansive consciousness within a breathing you know moving and breathing body but to be that to be that consciousness which is a delicious experience we get when we realize again that this body that in which we're moving about space is is, is is temporary it's temporal it's time sensitive our expansive timeless greater self that is as you say um it's it it's the past the present and the future self of us it's our spirit energy that um that wonderful pulsating um love is essentially what it is it's love yeah. it's made of love um it it, it defies I find it difficult to talk about because really it's not about finding words for it. It's the experience of it. It's something that we feel. Yeah. And I think that we have those moments that seem to defy logic or time, be they sort of fortuitous synchronicities or strange deja vus. Or we are touched by this, this sense of time as, as not being linear and perhaps having experienced things before that we could never have experienced in this present story, but we know so well, we're so familiar with. How do we make sense of that? It's the life of the spirit. Exactly. So above and beyond what we what we know in this um, particular iteration. But I said to to my husband last night, I I said I love I love that you're here and that we're here in our bodies, and I love to be able to touch you and to hold you. But I I love I love you. I love him as a spirit. I love his spirit self. I love his his freedom and his mm, um, things about him that I can't even put into words. But I, I I love him now. But I also loved him as a child. And I love him into time that I don't even know what that may look like or space. I don't know what that may look like. But that's how I love him. And when we truly see each other, that's how we can love each other. And when we truly see ourselves, that's how we love ourselves. And 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 it starts to put into perspective a whole lot of minutia that we used to maybe think was extremely important. It's not really important. And that's why love is so important. It's crucial for perspective as is gratitude. Yes. It really helps to give us the perspective we need to actually then manage what it is that matters most and get on with our lives in a creative way, doing things that are actually of great meaning and purpose and significance and value to ourselves and others. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, our true nature and purpose is to be of service, whether it's firstly to ourselves and then to mm -hmm. others and then to our planet, you know, and people yes. have forgotten that. And with yes. love, it's um, this incredible, I know it's um, hard to describe, it's indescribable. Mm -hmm. This is the force that has baffled scientists for century, centuries, and they, they still don't know what it truly is. It's the invisible, but we just know how it touches our heart and soul. And I think today, like you mentioned, you know, um, there's been a lot of uncertainty and fear. Like a lot of people, yeah think that um, 
love is the opposite of fear, but I, I tend to think love is the absence of fear. And mm. love is what creates everything. Love creates life, bringing new mm. life into the world. And, you know, when whether you mm. like babies or not, or you might like puppies, you know, having been a registered nurse and working on a gynae ward, when you see a new baby being born, oh my God, it just touches your heart and you're crying. And recently we've been traveling in our camper van and it's really bizarre because in Wales, we only have um, the lambing season in spring, but we've seen them here in autumn and just seeing the lambs prancing in the field, you know, love comes, as you say in your book, in so many forms. And, right. um, and I, I love, if I may interject, I love what you just said then about love and fear, because often love and fear, it's like a dichotomy, you know, people yeah. say, oh, it's either in any moment, you're either choosing love or choosing fear. I actually find that dichotomy to be very, very helpful when you come to a moment when you think, when you have to, when, when, it, when you come to take accountability for your thoughts yeah. and your actions, am I coming from a loving place or am I coming from a fearful place? And the loving place encompasses a whole lot of different subsections, as does the fearful place, you know. But yeah. I, I find that quite a helpful binary. It's sort of, you know, love, love or in that regard. However, yeah. I also think that there's something quite alchemical when it comes to looking at love and fear. And I don't know if maybe love is the absence of fear, but perhaps love is fear transformed. Because That's... when we are fearful... And we think, am I, you know, we, we make ourselves so vulnerable in love. When we love somebody else, we then run the risk of, of being absolutely heartbroken in losing them. Or we, we become, we run the, when, we're, when we fall in love and we just put ourselves on the line, we, we may be rejected. We may experience loss. We may experience grief, hardship, conflict. We make ourselves vulnerable. And yet somehow, as if plants, you know, as I wrote in the book as plants grow naturally into the light we human beings gravitate toward love even if we know that we're vulnerable in the face of it even if we know that we can't control that we sometimes can't even control ourselves love is ginormous and yeah. it's omniscient and it's encompassing yeah. you know we still go there and so perhaps love is really the it's some sort of wonderful uh, it's a wonderful reaction that comes from from the transformation of fear because we we are wired for survival as human beings and so the negativity bias about which we can read in, in positive psychology that's very real we're wired to protect ourselves we're wired to be cautious we're wired to know what berries not to eat so that we don't perish we're wired to for shelter so that we can survive we have a survival instinct and yet part of that survival instinct is community and kinship and part of that is 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 a big part of that is love and, and trust and connection and and so again it is part of our survival instinct um, and and that love and fear conversation is is primal it's so primal uh, and there's a lot to unpack within that but I like to think of love as transformative because we all go through emotions we can't I don't feel that we can walk through this life I feel that we can cultivate fearlessness as part of our personality, our personal reality. I feel we can cultivate a sense of fearlessness yeah. and bravery, but love and fear are part of being alive. They're part of the patchwork of our aliveness. But if we can see the overarching nature of love and then use, use that power and that presence that we can create within that awareness to transform fear, then we're on our way yeah. through any, any kind of land. We can I, I totally agree. Mm. I totally agree. What I was meaning, um, because it's like night and day, we always have the opposites on one level, night and day, you know, dark and light, as you mentioned. Yeah. But in the present moment, you can only feel one emotion. So if you're feeling love, you're not feeling yeah. fear. So it's about reminding ourselves to choose love and you yes, mentioned thoughts that. and when we grown up well especially in wales and britain people go Shh, little girls don't cry little boys don't cry sit in the corner watch what you say you know so we're told watch what we say but nobody tells us watch what we think and nobody questions our thoughts you know in the quantum yes. field 
you know, you and I could be chatting happily now and feeling the love energy because we're both passionate about it. Someone could walk in the room and mm. or this could even be at the supermarket or any line. You're feeling really grow, great. And then all of a sudden you, your mood changes out of the blue and you feel yeah. upset. Yeah. And we don't think, where did that thought come from? What, why am I feeling this? Nobody questions it. So... Yeah. Absolutely. And that's fascinating because I and I, you're preaching to the choir here because I'm um I always think this is this is fundamental emotional intelligence. People don't yeah. people, I, I, I think about this a great deal. People don't talk enough about how they think, why yeah. they think the way they think. We don't, con this isn't common conversation. We're happy to talk about that which we own, that which we're doing, our, our, if we have them, our children, what they're doing, what we did, what we're about to do. But what about the actual foundation of all of that, our thoughts? Are we, are we talking about how we're thinking, how our thoughts are making us feel? Are we, and as you say, for children, a children taught, you know, I certainly at school wasn't taught about the art of thinking. And in fact, I'm working on a project to do with this at the moment but the actual art of thinking to think creatively to think lovingly to think freely to think independently these are so in, in, in port, important these ideas and and where are they within our education system that's something we can look at you know we can yeah. look at changing um, you know you and I are very passionate people and no doubt our listeners are too we're passionate about seeing positive change and we believe that it's possible if we didn't believe positive change you know was a possibility we wouldn't be talking we we know that something is cooking right now you know in the cosmic kitchen there's change yeah. there's change coming it's necessary we cannot our systems have just exposed themselves as being so feeble and so outworn so many systems upon which we relied so you know um, well, many of us not so confidently but upon which many people so confidently and blindly relied they're being shown not to work very well at all in fact they're making us miserable and they're making us stressed and sad. And, and so this is an ideological change. This is a shift we're talking about, a very, yeah. very big shift. But it's not beyond us. Oh, no. But we have like, to be in our heart. Yeah. Mm. On a soul level, we all signed up for this. And there's nothing mm. that the universe will put in our pathway that we can't deal with. It's just that when we pass through the veil of unforgetfulness, Everything is new and we've completely forgotten, but um, just wanted to reassure the listeners, we can all deal with it, you know, and collectively, you know, when you look at what's been happening, it's like a fear energy globally. And, yes. you know, we've all had the opportunity to sit and be quiet and look within. Many people yes. have lost their um lives lost jobs lost loved ones yes. you know and yes. loss and grief come in so many ways and we're all affected differently you know and some people just not having that social interaction because our innate being is to connect and socialize and you've mentioned connection a few times and you know this is so important that we connect and express yes. our feelings and you know our internet, you know, is telling us, you know, feel me, mm -hmm. feel me, you know, sit with me, mm -hmm. play with me, you know, but we mm -hmm. are trapped in our busyness. And yes. I know in France, you know, on one level after the first lockdown, we only had, we had 80% of pollution less, you know, yes. and which was amazing from nobody using cars, you know, and you know, because clean air is so important and the way we breathe and act and feel. But everybody with have been given the opportunity to now think, what do I want to do with my life? You can be a creative mm -hmm. goddess. And I know, Moretta, that you do coaching one-on-one -on -one, and you also run women's groups. So for the listeners, um, what tips would you give them to get through these uncertain times? Oh, Deidre, you brought us right back down to earth and I love it because <laughs> very, very meaningful but very esoteric conversations about love. I can skyrocket away, but I am very much 
um, about practical philosophy and that is what my books are about and that is what I, I, I wish to bring, you know, not only today to this conversation but generally because, you know, we can wax lyrical about these fabulous ideas and my goodness, they, you know, they will occupy my mind and my heart forevermore but when it comes to the daily, how yeah. we do this, how do we this, how do we make this happen? Very, very important because, again, we need to be resourced and often, you know, it would be a wonderful world where these resources were readily available taught in schools. They were out there. It was not, you know, just common sense, which I think a lot of this is. It's common sense. It's not common practice. So what it's about now is, is making these ideas that make complete sense if you spend just a moment thinking about them, but they're not commonly practised. How do we make this the way we live, the way we are, the way we breathe? You know, you talk about breath with your work, the way we breathe, love, you know, the way we're, we're operating. This is our operating system here, you know. We've, it's a privilege to be alive. And sure, we've been through difficult times, but now we're being called to transform what we've been through. You know, a diamond is is forged with pressure, and we we know that we know that pressure is incredibly difficult to endure. But it's character building, and it shapes us, and it grows us. And here we are. We have an opportunity to learn from that which we've been through. You know, we spoke earlier before we we started um, recording this session today, and we said to one another, some people have come out of lockdown, and they have really learned these tremendous life lessons, and they have transformed. But we see a lot of evidence on earth. That people, many people have just gone back to the daily grind, the way things were. Has change really been taken in on a heart and soul level? Have we really changed? What have we learned from this? But we're being called to learn from this. This is big and we can't just let it go by as if it didn't happen, be inconvenienced by it and push on because there's gold in this to be, to be extracted and to be worked with. So yeah. what I like to look at is, and I look at love, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll break it down into the three areas I look at love, just to be really simple about it. I look at love in terms of self-love, love for the self, our inner world, being at home within, nurturing that space. What does that mean? Then I look at love in relationships, forgiveness, faith, communication, tenderness, patience, care. What does that mean? And the third piece, our earth, globally, collectively, people we don't know, complete strangers we bump into, people we can only imagine what their rea realities must look like in a different country, in a different socioeconomic framework, different everything to that which we know and we have. How does that look? How does loving them look? How does caring about them look? Why does it matter? So I start with us and, and, and the person, our personal intimate self-love story because it begins with us. Gandhi said, be the change you wish to see in the world. It's famous for a reason. It's because it's true. We need to be that change. We can't wait for change to happen all around us and then participate in it. We can't wait for other people to change before we change. We change first. And when we change, the whole world changes. The way the world looks and feels changes. So how do we love ourselves? It's kindness. It's compassion. You know, often we're very quick to judge and 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 to be almost um, careless with ourselves. We're very judgmental of ourselves. We can often treat ourselves more harshly than we ever would a friend or a family member. We're thinking about all our shortcomings, what we didn't do right, how we don't look, how we do look, what we. If we're able to tune ourselves into that conversation a little bit more and really connect with the tone of our inner voice, we can then intercept it. We can work with it we can soften it we can start to hear a voice that we really want to hear and make our inner voice the kindest voice that we know and once we do that we have a very different relationship with ourselves we begin to be able to smile at ourselves or laugh with ourselves or support ourselves when we need it and lift ourselves up with our thoughts rather than frighten ourselves with our thoughts you know love ourselves with our thoughts so at thought level, we then are able to cultivate a completely different relationship with ourselves that then fills our wellspring of love and our love for others, which leads into part two, relationships and others. That's the cup from which we pour because we can't pour from an empty cup. But you and I both know that when we love and care for ourselves and the cup of is, is overfloweth, <laughs> we laugh about it <laughs> We always say the cup is, the cup is overflowing. When it starts to get to that point, the love bubbles over. 
you can't help but actually share that love with others even if it's just that in your tenderness with yourself and your softness with yourself that you have the energy to actually be present for somebody to listen carefully to love love them a little bit more gently to be with them a little bit more gently you can't do that if you're angry and hurried and worried about yourself and caught up and you can't where is that where is the availability of that love it comes through self-love and care. And then we're able to share that with others. So we find that when we're looking after ourselves and we're gentler with ourselves and we're more compassionate with ourselves, we're naturally more compassionate, gentle, kind and tolerant with others. And people feel that. Then their world changes, the dynamic changes, the energy changes. And this is what we need. This is the softness and kindness we need. And people say to me, Meredith, how are we meant to be kind toward people that are so unkind and so mean and so unloving? They're the ones that need it the most. Exactly. Our kindness matters most. You know, to people who really can't, they can't be giving of it because they're not giving it to themselves. And you wonder what kind of inner world they're dwelling in. They need that extra love. They need to. We need to live by example. We don't need to be, you know, one up on anybody else so it's not about right or wrong it's Rumi wrote those beautiful words beyond ideas of right doing or wrong doing there's a field and I'll meet yes. you there and in yes. that field you know think about that field it's non-judgment it's love it's not what did I do what didn't I do what did you do or didn't do or no let's just meet there in that field and and also we realize more and more that when we live that way that areas in our, in our lives that used to contain unrest or conflict or disharmony, they soften. So love is sort of smoothing the edges. It works on every level. It's smoothing the edges. It's easing our way. It allows us to live more gracefully, harmoniously, first of all with ourselves and then with others with whom we're sharing our lives. It softens the way we speak. It softens the way we touch. It changes everything and people feel it. You know, it, it's extraordinary. People feel it. And um, a man came to deliver me a desk the other week and he said to me, <laughs> it was so amazing. He said, um, he said, you are love. He said, you're love. <laughs> and he said, I, he said, I know, I've, I've studied love. And I said, that's amazing. You know, he, it turned out that he was a very spiritual man who'd done many workshops about heart-centered living. And who would have thought, you know, I just... And, yeah. and and it, you feel it, you feel it, and and you and I feel it. We we picked up the phone when we first met. We met per phone. We picked up the phone, and we were bubbling with so much love that two hours passed in two minutes. <laughs> amazing to think about what a conversation that was. You know, it's amazing how how these things are felt. But to the third point, which is this more global story, it's a more collective energy of love, and we're talking about that now because we we went through this on a global level, and obviously it affected everybody very differently. It affected individual countries very differently. Even within Australia, we know Melbourne suffered lockdowns in a way like no other state in Australia. Mm. We know that the mental health fallout in Victoria is huge. I've been working with Melbourne councils lately in healthcare initiatives. That's a, they're all about bounce back. They're about regeneration, transformation. I've had the privilege of working in the last couple of weeks with Stonington City Council, which covers um, Durack, South Yarra, inner city parts of you know, um, yeah. Melbourne. We've been talking about how love, how relaxation, how self-care can recharge our batteries now because we are dealing with the fallout of great disappointment and trauma, people who've missed really significant events in their lives, people who've lost loved ones, like you've said. This is not small, this is big picture stuff and we've been in it together. Mm. You know, often we feel very alone in our disappointment or our grief or our concern or our loss, but this is a shared experience. You know, and as you know, with your healing and energy work, that you, you're you constantly putting out an energy of love. And in this book, yeah. in Choosing Love, through the conversations with the heart and the conversations through prayer, I suggest that these very intangible ways that may in the past have been considered to, you know, heaven forbid be woo-woo or not to work in any way, they work. It's now time that we generate the energy of love through our actions, our thoughts, our prayers, our collective way of, of acknowledging our communal need for tenderness and for compassion, for understanding, for tolerance. And there are, the problems are manifold and they may be complicated, but the answers are simple. And the answer is to yes. me singular and it's simple and it's love. 
you know people could say but there's this 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 and this happening but there's and, and yes my goodness the problems are so complicated we can't even begin to speak to them but we can begin to speak to love and that's what this book is about yeah because we did you know, if we feel disempowered or overcome where do we begin but we can begin we can always begin with love and that's where I hope my my, my work can come in and my books can come in because there is a way oh and yeah. and it's that I think it's, it's, and it doesn't exclude anybody. Love is for everyone. It's for all of us to choose and to practice and it's for all of us to receive and benefit from and be rejuvenated by. I totally agree and you said it so well. And, you know, the biggest message for everyone is be the change you want the world to be because it's like skimming a pebble in the pond and as you become the change, you will radiate out the love. And love is the remedy, love is the answer, love is the key. And it's simple, so you don't need to make it hard. Um, yeah. I'm con consciously aware of the time, and I know us two could chat for hours. So yeah, where's the best place for people to contact you? And of course, I'll put all your links, your social media handles with the written oh, notes as well. Yeah. yeah, just to watch you not complicated that's one of my favorite things to say I say it as many times a day as I can because it keeps me grounded too it's not complicated you know yeah. keep choosing love and and it fortifies us so as for finding me and there's so much more to say and I hope that we'll talk again Beverly because you know we've only just touched well this is we've touched on it but we've got so much <laughs> more to say yeah you can find me at um well, I have social media platforms, so that's Facebook and Instagram for me. Yeah. Um, just under my name, Gaston. Um, I love that you say Meredith. It's it's it's, it's proper pronunciation in, in in Welsh, which I thought uh, no yeah. one has ever actually called Meredith yeah. before until I met you. Um, and bless Deirdre for introducing us because what a woman yeah. and um, she's gorgeous. So I'm at MeredithGaston.com. M-E-R-E-D-I-T-H-G-A-S-T-O-N. And my Facebook and Instagram are Meredith Gaston. And this is my 10th book, this book on love. I've just finished my 11th book on being in the present moment and we've got a lot to talk about there. But yeah. um, choosing living our lives to nourish our hearts is the title of the book um, that we've been speaking a little bit about today. Thank you. And I would love to do a follow-up call because you have so much to share with the world and... Um, thank you for all you are and all you do. And it's wonderful the work you're doing with the people in Melbourne. So thank you very thank much. You, thank thank you. you. It's my pleasure. Thank you for your time. Thank you.